we, we see alternative data being used extensively now, both in the, quant, in the quant world, but also in the fundamental world. I'd be interested to know what you see as the difference in how data is used in those two different approaches. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I was uh, fortunate enough to, uh, I ran uh, Majestic Research, which was the first sort of alternative database research firm, and uh, we had a number of both uh, discretionary and, and, and quant clients. And then prior to joining Two Sigma, I spent five years as a partner at a you know, tiger cub sort of concentrated discretionary fund um, where we leveraged lots of alternative data. So you know, from, from both the uh, provider side as well as uh, the principal side, um, I've gotten to you know, get a flavor of you know, the, the differences. And so uh, a couple of the differences. One, uh, you know, when, when you're in a concentrated portfolio, um, your threshold uh, for the type of edge you need to make money is much higher than it is if you're more diversified, right? And so, you know, if you only own a small number of equities, you really have to go very deep into each one, or even into just like sourcing new ideas, you have to go quite deep. And then when you're committing capital, you want to understand the business you know, sometimes in ways that management doesn't even understand if you have um, access to data that they don't. And I could give you a lot of funny examples where we were teaching management things about their business at my former uh, position. And so, you know, the, the threshold, you know, for an edge and, and some of these discretionary funds might spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, on a data set that could only give them an edge on one name that they care about, right? That, that wouldn't be the most efficient use of capital for a quant where you're looking at thousands of names um, and you're looking at things cross-sectionally and if you only have a small edge, you know, because you're employing leverage and you want to take as many bets as possible where you think you have an edge, you know, then, then that's something that you can use in a way that a discretionary investor uh, can't. Another interesting difference is in the quant side um, where we run lots of simulations and we can say, you know, these are the different types of models uh, that we could build with this data cross-sectionally. Here are some you know, plain vanilla features. It, it gives you a real metric that you can kind of measure uh, the marginal incremental P&L that you're going to get from licensing a data set and then maybe apply some multiple to that as far as what you're willing to pay for the data set. Whereas I feel like it's more loosey-goosey on the discretionary side in terms of how you price and value a data set. Lastly, I, I would just say that it's not an either or. Um, most quants, including at Two Sigma, if you look at our job, job board, you'll see a lot of job applications for people who have a background in the discretionary side. Um, people with that background will help us think more creatively uh, into the types of features that we can create, um, what are the you know, important you know, under, underlying drivers of businesses. And meanwhile, every discretionary shop of consequence, uh, in all likelihood, has a pretty strong data science effort whereby they're hiring quants. Thanks. Um, I'd love to hear some of those stories, Tony, but I won't ask you. Um, as a follow-up question, I mean, you've, you've been in the industry for a long time. Um, what do you think are the most significant changes over the last 10 years that you've seen in alternative data? Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, my, my colleague said something that, that uh, my colleague here, my peer, uh, that resonated with me in terms of the difference between, you know, now casting and forecasting. Um, you know, like any type of sort of arbitrage strategy, like if, you, if I can use credit card data um, to understand, you know, what Starbucks same store sales are doing, uh, that's different from consensus. Years ago, that's something that you could make a lot of money just trading those types of um, information arbitrage opportunities. Today, you know, you have to have a certain amount of hubris to think that you're the only one that's going to be able to make money. It's a zero-sum game at a certain point. And so it's really trying to think in a more nuanced way. What are the uh, types of questions you can ask that matter for the future that you can use the, um, the, the, the alternative data to really get conviction in a strong uh, investment thesis. So I think, you know, the types of questions people are asking of the data uh, becomes more and more nuanced, more and more about really understanding what are the longer-term drivers of a business. 
Um, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, that, that there's just more of that data out there. And, uh, you know, we're, we're finding different data across new sectors, across new geographies. And so, uh, you know, years ago, it was almost exclusively the North American consumer uh, with some healthcare sprinkled in. And now, you know, there's all sorts of sectors. I, I think the good news is I still think we're scratching the surface. I think, you know, there's great things in the future. And, you know, not just for investors, but, you know, for market research in general, I think is an industry ripe for disruption. And you, you see some of the acquisitions that market research companies are making in the alt data space because they see the writing on the wall too and realize that, like, you know, surveys and focus groups are, are going to be, a, you know, a much smaller part going forward. So... Uh, Dan, you're from the data supply side at S&P. Do you share similar views or do you see things differently? What do you think's changed in the last 10 years? I definitely, uh, I think Tony touched on a lot of uh, important points there. From the vendor side, you know, I'd say the biggest change we've seen has been in the type of client looking for alternative data. Uh, 10 years ago, and to some extent even five years ago, it was almost exclusively the, the sort of data science, quant, investment management, public, usually equities, and North American focused uh, shop, whereas today we're seeing an ever-increasing demand uh, from the fundamental side, from private markets, is a big space uh, that's in development, from X North America. Um, and as, as the uh, so the adoption has gotten broader and the diversity of the base using the alternative data has gotten broader, so has the data itself. The other thing I'll say is, in addition to the increase in breadth, has been the increase in depth. Uh, I think probably because some of the early adopters were those quant and data science shops that wanted to place a large number of bets, uh, the content sets that gained traction were uh, content sets that spoke to the whole universe uh, of, of uh, public equities usually. Uh, now we're seeing uh, more adoption of nuanced data sets that may only inform on, say, 30 names, but it's very deep, industry-rich content. Um, and then the last thing I'll say as far as, as, far as uh, developments in space, technology. Uh, and I know that that's one that, that we've been hearing for 10 years, technology is, is growing so fast, but if you think about it, it was just 25, 30 years ago that we still had clients getting CompuStat data on CD-ROM. We would mail them the CDs uh, at the end of each month. And now we have uh, summer interns in, in uh, house that are all fluent in PySpark and standing up ML stacks on AWS and using four terabytes of data in the cloud and they're, you know, they're doing it from home on their sofa. I think the implications of that sort of technology development just uh, is still not fully baked in uh, to the industry yet. 